Now, we're also honoured to have someone who's well known to our Australian audience, um, Mr. Sol Eslake, who's the economist for Carina Economic Advisory. And he's going to explain to us the Indonesian economy and what, it ma- what makes it a potential investment destination post the pandemic. So Sol is one of Australia's best known economic analysts and commentators, having worked in Australia's financial markets for more than 25 years, including as Chief Economist at the ANZ Bank from 1995 to 2009, and as Australia and New Zealand Chief Economist for Bank of America Merrill Lynch. In 2015, Sol established his own economics consultancy, Karina Economic Advisory, and this year has begun to partner with a similar London-based business called Llewellyn Consulting to form independent economics, an advisory business with a global reach. Now, Sol's been following emerging Asian economies since the late 1990s, developing a more detailed understanding of them during his time at ANZ, which was the only bank with operations in across North, Southeast and South Asia. Karina Economic Advisory has a particular focus on China and Indonesia as the two largest emerging economies in East Asia. And Seoul believes that Indonesia, with the world's fourth largest population and 16th largest economy, which is changing dramatically, has the potential to become one of the world's most promising investment destinations. Now, just before we hear from Seoul, just a reminder, if you'd like to put questions in the Q&A box, or use the raise hand feature to ask a question directly during the Q&A session that's coming up. Over to you, Sol. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for the introduction. Um, uh, Salamat siang, pak vedi, pak riki, para hadiran yang terhormat. Uh, thank you also to pak Henry and Bu Arum for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, present part of this seminar, this webinar today. It's uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to present to this audience about investment opportunities in Indonesia and why it is in particular attractive from a macroeconomic perspective. My first point is to note that in its most recent set of forecasts mm-hmm. issued in October, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, forecast that Indonesia would grow at an average annual rate of 5.7% over the five years to 2026. That is after it's assumed that most economies have returned to something approximating normal after the experience of the recession and then recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. What I'd particularly draw to your attention is that Indonesia is forecast to grow at a faster rate than China, for whom the IMF is forecasting growth of 5.2% per annum on average over the five years to 2026. And that disguises the fact that the IMF, like most other forecasters, actually see China's growth slowing quite consistently over that period from above 5.2% in 2023 and 2024 to below 5% by the end of that period, whereas Indonesia's growth rate is expected to be fairly steady at five and a half to five and three quarters percent per annum over this period. Now, there are, as you can see, a handful of countries who are expected to have faster growth than Indonesia, although there are many more which will have slower growth. But I want to secondly draw what I think is some important distinctions between Indonesia and that small number of countries which have faster economic growth in ahead of them, according to the International Monetary Fund. This first chart here shows the forecasts for growth over the five years to 2026, as I've just outlined, mapped against per capita income or GDP at purchasing power parities in the year before the pandemic. And so the first contrast I want to draw between Indonesia and those other countries that appear to have faster growth is that all of them are poorer than Indonesia. That is, they have lower levels of per capita income than Indonesia has. And that includes the other countries in ASEAN, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Cambodia. 
And the other ones you can see are relatively small African economies who are considerably poorer, not only than Indonesia, but the other economies than ASEAN. And that's important because with a per capita income of Indonesia's level, which puts it in the middle income emerging economies group of countries as nominated by the World Bank. The range of investment opportunities is considerably wider in Indonesia than it is in the other countries where faster growth is forecast. In particular, there are more opportunities in the services sector, which is proportionately larger in Indonesia than it is in those other economies which are expected to experience faster growth. Another comparison I draw, as shown in the right-hand chart here, is Indonesia's ranking in terms of global competitiveness. Now, this is a little bit like the ease of doing business rankings that Puck Ricky showed in his presentation earlier, but it's just a different dimension of some of the aspects of the economic, regulatory and social environment that go up to making international competitiveness. And again, the point I'd emphasize is that all the economies that appear to have faster growth than Indonesia over the next five years are, according to the World Economic Forum, less competitive than Indonesia is. So that combination of rapid growth, higher on average incomes, and greater competitiveness compared with those countries that do rank higher in terms of forecast economic growth than Indonesia is part of why I think that Indonesia offers one of the most attractive macroeconomic environments for foreign investors of any economy in the world, large or small, in any of the world's major economic regions. Recording in, in progress. As an alternative for important supply chain components for Australia is, I think, particularly important at this juncture. But of course, speaking as an economist, economic growth in its own is not the only thing that is important in determining whether a country is an attractive destination. What's also important is how stable that economic growth is likely to be. Will economic growth be at a steady and rapid pace? Or will that seemingly high average rate of growth disguise considerable fluctuations in economic activity because of a country's vulnerability to other external shocks? Now, of course, in the past, e Indonesia has experienced considerable economic volatility in its growth, in part because of other dimensions of its economic performance that have left it vulnerable to external shocks. One of those has been Indonesia's propensity in the past to run what have sometimes been large current account deficits on its balance of payments. Those deficits went away for a while in the early 2000s when, first of all, Indonesia's economic growth was not as strong as it is now, but secondly, when it was at its peak production of oil at a time when oil prices were particularly high. That latter advantage has, of course, gone away with the decline in Indonesia's oil exports. But what we see now is that Indonesia is running current account deficits, which are sustainable. That is to say, they are smaller as a percentage of GDP than Indonesia's growth rate is, which means that the liabilities incurred in order to finance those current account deficits will not increase as a proportion of GDP and thus threaten economic stability. Let me also add here that there's nothing wrong with a developing economy running current account deficits. Indeed, it's only by running current account deficits that a country can import capital, import investment from overseas. Countries which run current account surpluses are by definition exporters of investment capital, not importers of them, as Indonesia wishes to be. The critical thing is that those current account deficits don't add unsustainable amounts to the stock of liabilities which a country has. And Indonesia has been very successful in recent years in keeping its current account deficit within stable, manageable proportions. The other problem which has plagued Indonesia's experience for a very long period of time has been high rates of inflation. 
especially in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 22 years ago. But even more recently than that, Indonesia's inflation rate has been significantly above those of its trading partners and competitors. What's been particularly encouraging in recent years is that Indonesia has gotten on top of that problem. And inflation in Indonesia over the past five years has been around 2%, comfortably within Bank Indonesia's inflation target, and that's continued through the pandemic. The IMF expects that Indonesia's inflation rate will average just below 3% over the five years to 2026, and that also is a recipe for financial stability. Another important dimension of financial stability, as economists see it, is the conduct of fiscal policy. Countries which run large budget deficits and accumulate significant increasing amounts of public debt are typically more exposed to economic shocks than those which maintain stable public finances. Again, there's nothing wrong with a government running a budget deficit, particularly one in a developing country which needs to invest in its future economic growth, as Indonesia does. The important question is whether the deficits that are being run are sustainable. And if those deficits are lower than the proportion, are low as a proportion of GDP, and if public debt is stable as a proportion of GDP, then there is not much to worry about that. And what you can see from these charts is that the budget deficits which Indonesia is has been running and proposes to run in the years ahead are lower than the growth rate of GDP, lower than the average for middle-income emerging economies, and the public debt which is being incurred in order to finance those deficits represents a smaller proportion of Indonesia's GDP than is the case for the group of all middle-income emerging economies. Indeed, the public debt which Indonesia is going to have in five years' time will be less as a proportion of GDP than will be the case for Australia, which I think is an important comparison. So the significance of all of this is that Indonesia stands a good chance of sustaining the very significant decline in interest rates that's occurred over the last 10 years, which is a positive for the financial environment. And especially from the perspective of foreign investors, there's also a very good prospect that the stability in the rupiah that's been observed and maintained over the last three years will be extended into the foreseeable future. Now, that's not to say that there won't be fluctuations in the currency. Of course, there will. But the recent history is that Bank Indonesia and Indonesia more broadly has done a much better job of maintaining the confidence of international capital markets and investors than it had been able to do over the first 15 years or so of this century. And as I hope I've explained, there are good reasons to expect that confidence to be maintained into the future. Uh, Indonesia has maintained a sustainable external position despite the loss of oil exports, and that has been reflected in a significant increase in the volume of direct investment flows into Indonesia's economy. As you can see expressed as a proportion of Indonesia's GDP, foreign investment into Indonesia has in most of the past five years, exceeded 2% of GDP and has been equivalent to more than 4% of total foreign in debt direct investment flows into emerging and developing economies. Other speakers have already mentioned some of the improvements that are taking place in the regulatory environment in Indonesia, what I as an economist sometimes call the microeconomic climate, as distinct from the macroeconomic climate, which I've just been discussing. Pak Ricky in particular went into some detail about the omnibus job creation law that was passed in November last year, and which is gradually being rolled out over the course of this and next year. And the key point is that that does introduce a much more attractive framework for business licensing. It's much clearer as to which are the areas in which foreign investment is welcomed 
and those in which it is either banned or not encouraged. It provides for a more attractive corporate tax environment over the next three years than had been the case before. And it also seeks to address some of the concerns that both domestic and foreign employers have had in Indonesia regarding issues such as the employment of foreign workers and the length of the terms for which they can be employed. From an Australian perspective, the other really important development is, of course, the coming into effect of the Australia-Indonesia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which not only reduces barriers to trade between our two nations, but of particular importance in the context of today's webinar, opens up specific areas to Australian investors that are not open to other investors with whom Australia may be competing in order to establish a presence in Indonesia. And I've provided a list here that comes from a, a document prepared by Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, but it just gives you an indication of the new opportunities for Australian investment, particularly in the services sector, which hasn't been as much of a focus for Australian investors as in particular the mining sector has been for much of the past 20 or so years. So Australian investment in Indonesia has been relatively slow in recent years. And in 2018, there was a significant disinvestment by at least one Australian investor. It's no surprise that investment fell last year during COVID when it was so difficult to undertake the personal travel that's often a very important part of deepening investment ties. But I think there's every reason to be optimistic that Australia's relationship, investment relationship with Indonesia will improve following the coming into force of the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement between our two countries. So to summarise what I think are the important points of this, Indonesia will be one of the most rapidly growing economies in the world over the next five years. In particular, it's going to grow more rapidly than China, which has been the largest destination for foreign investment in the developing world in the last 30 years. And although there are some economies who are forecast to have faster growth than Indonesia, such as India, Philippines, Vietnam, and some African countries, Indonesia nonetheless has a higher per capita income and stronger competitiveness ranking, which I think is an important additional dimension to the range of investment opportunities that there are likely to be, especially in the services sector. In important other respects, Indonesia is able to offer a more stable macroeconomic environment than it has in the past because of its evident success in maintaining the current account deficit within sustainable bounds and keeping inflation low and stable, which to me as an economist, gives me a great deal more confidence that interest rates will remain low and relatively stable and that the exchange rate can also remain stable, removing or at least reducing what has traditionally been one of the key risk factors that might have deterred higher levels of investment in Indonesia in the past. Indonesia now offers a more open and predictable legal and regulatory environment than previously. And the omnibus law directly addresses many of the long-standing concerns that foreign investors have had. From a bilateral perspective, AICPA opens doors to Australian investors that are not currently available to investors from many other countries. So in my view, Indonesia will represent increasingly a viable and attractive alternative to businesses from Australia, and in particular those that are looking to reduce their own and Australians as a whole, dependence on or exposure to China. And in that context, I think this is a very opportune moment to be focusing on the investment opportunities that are now coming forward to Australian businesses in our most important neighbour, Indonesia. Uh, terima kasih, and thank you for allowing me to share those views. Thank you, Sol, and, and thank you for referencing the recently released blueprint that ARBC and others have worked on with the Department of Foreign Affairs. It's a great document, a great source of information. I highly recommend people have a look at it because there's a lot of data in there, which is great for building business cases. And so there's lots of really good news there, and it's looking like there's a convergence of uh, well-managed economic activities are really coming together. 
And it's great to hear from someone who's so well regarded here in Australia as to give that sort of reference point for us to have confidence about Indonesia and where it's going. Um, I'm going to kick off the Q&A section now um, and we've got a couple of questions that were submitted um, as part of the registration. So from Inga Cristidianto, what sector people what sector people think will grow significantly over the next three years? So I might go to Sol on that one to kick off, if you like. I think there's a broad variety of sectors that have strong opportunities for growth. I mean, most obviously mining will because of the ongoing demand for some of the commodities in which Indonesia has particular strengths, I mean, natural gas being an obvious one. Um, Indonesia has a longer-term risk, of course, arising from its position as the world's leading exporter of thermal coal. Over time, the demand for thermal coal is going to wind down as the world transitions to net zero emissions. But being a significant gas exporter is... Uh, to some extent mediates that risk, but other minerals that are important uh, will be important. Agricultural exports will, I think, be increasingly important as uh, more people reach levels of per capita income that are in turn underpinning more protein-intensive diets, and Indonesia has capacity there. But I think the most important avenues for growth are in the services sectors as uh, Indonesia's incomes go more into the middle income territory, that is, you know, between about 15,000 and eventually 25,000 US dollars per head. Uh, the experience of every country who's reached that level is that services become an increasingly important part of the economy. And Indonesia, where you, know, you have in excess of 60 million people who are well above middle income status already, you're talking about a range of more sophisticated services in areas like health, financial services, travel, uh, recreation, insurance, uh, and aged care, those sorts of things. And then the final area where I think Indonesia has considerable potential, but it might take some time for the scale of investment required to be realised is as an alternative to China as a source of important manufacturing activities. Now, manufacturing is very capital intensive, of course, and it takes time to set up manufacturing capabilities and establish them into global supply chains. But you know, I, it's certainly my impression around the world that there is growing concern about the dependence on single suppliers in China that many countries now find themselves in. And some of that concern is related to the deteriorating or changing geopolitical environment. But some of it's also just a risk management issue that's been exposed by COVID, that even if political relationships were unchanged and stable, um, there would still be greater concern now as a result of some of the experiences that have been thrown up by COVID of being too dependent on a single source of supply or a single country for the supply of things that, can be extremely important to countries and to businesses in periods like the one that we've just gone through. And I think there's an enormous in opportunity for Indonesia to insert itself into that space, uh, but it will take time for all of that to come to full fruition, I think. Yeah, yeah, very good points. 